Yo, yo, welcome and thanks for joining. Once again, it's your boy, F-A-C-E, Feet on the Ground, Ears to the Street, coming at you with another groundbreaking exclusive. Now, this video right here, I'm going to be detailing some of my experiences with JT, the bigger figure, man. You know what I'm saying? Now, I'm not doing this video with the intention on speaking bad about nobody, but if it sounds like, you know, I'm speaking bad, I'm just really speaking the truth. That's all I can do, bro. You know, I'm a Muslim, so I'm not into, like, just speaking fake stuff or oppressing people with slander and stuff like that. And uh, also, I feel like as black people, bro, we got enough, like, us hating on each other. You know, uh, it's already, like, issues with, like, we don't spend money with each other the way we spend with other, you know, races when it comes to our wealth. You know, black people is an economical powerhouse. I was just listening to Dr. Boyce Watkins and uh, also reading um, Powernomics, you know, black wealth, uh, white, white, white wealth, black labor, white wealth by uh, Dr. Claude Anderson. And it talked a lot about the economic structure of black people in America, where the money is going and the fact that we spend one point six billion dollars a year. And like 80, 90 percent of that money is with other races. Actually, we, we hardly spend any money with our own. And when we do, it's like really insignificant. So I think when it comes to black people and how we deal with each other, I think really it needs a lot of work. I mean, we need a total rehaul. I mean, excuse me, we need a total um, overhaul of how we think about money, wealth and also our social relationships. But with that in mind, there's also a lot of black people who is at a higher level of business and also, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not necessarily potential, but what they have access to because of most of the time entertainment, um, you know, or unfortunately like people doing illegal stuff, you know. But um, the point I'm making is some black people who do have the influence and the money, they totally are disconnected from, like, the true issues that's going on in black America. For, for an example, I did a video, like, a week ago talking about um, the great replacement theory and how certain individuals in America right now are targeting black people because they feel like we're replacing them when it comes to African Americans and also migrants and also the Hispanic race, they feel like they're being replaced by minorities. And if we're not equal in number right now, we're going to be the majority in like the next 20 years. When you look at the birth rates, when you look at the, um, the decline in birth rates, when it comes to the Caucasians and the constant increase in birth rates with the black Hispanics and then how many people are migrating and um, immigrating to America. So it's been a lot of talk on the internet about um, population control, um, race wars. I mean, this stuff is big. And if you're not noticing and watching the news, it's been so many mass shootings. And each mass shooting is targeting minority spaces like a Jewish synagogue, um, black churches, uh, grocery stores where black people shop, the Walmart up in Texas where it was predominantly Mexicans in there. Um, you know, um, just now, today, it was a mass shooting in Tulsa, Oklahoma, you know, and that's the same place Black Wall Street got started. You know, so not only do us as African Americans have a problem with how we interact with each other economically and socially, but the other races don't always necessarily have good interactions with us. And it's also racial disparities in the hospitals, in the schools, in the police department, with with banking, with farming. I mean, this stuff has been already talked about. You know, Oprah just did the Smith the um, Smith the Smithsonian. Um, documentary talking about the disparities in the health world and in the hospitals where they treat African-American women totally different than white women and the uh, mortality rates are a lot higher for African-American women. 
I mean, we're talking about real issues, but you don't hear certain people talking about this stuff. They rather talk about young Dolph and who got shot up and who drilling on who and doing the same stuff, but they don't talk about the real issues. You know what I'm saying? So that's a major problem. And I'm not trying to add to that toxic culture by talking about another black man disparagingly, but when people, you know, treat other people wrong and just think about they self when it comes to wealth and they actually start stealing, you know, that's my problem with JT because I did some work for him, which I'm going to detail in this story, and I never got my money, but he got the money. And it was about $40,000, you know what I'm saying? My cut was a small piece of that, but he didn't give me a dollar, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, let's start from the beginning. Um, if you're familiar with my channel, you already know I do prison stories. You already know I've been to the pen. If you're new to the channel, you know, I'm going to go ahead and give you uh, a little information about myself, man. My name is Willie, you know, but everybody call me Face in the Bay. You feel me? F-A-C-E. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, I'm in my late 30s. I'm about to be 40 in June. You know, just in about three weeks, I'm going to be 40 years old. So, you know, I'm not no young, no, no, no young cat no more. I'm basically an OG now. But, you know, this story go back like 10 years ago, a little more than 10 years ago, when I was fresh getting out the pen, you feel me? I, I did four years for an armed robbery in Miami, Florida. You know, that's a whole nother story. I ain't gonna get into them details, but as I was getting out the pen, you know, uh, by me having connections in the music industry, you know, I've been away from the Bay for like going on five years because I've been out here in Florida in the pen. So I was real excited about going home, going back to the Bay, and seeing what it do, you know, because I had been reading in the Vibe magazine about the hyphy movement and, you know, like, when I was out there, hyphy didn't mean what, what that meant. You know, when I was reading about the hyphy movement and seeing it, I was like, bro, that ain't what hyphy mean, bro. Like, hyphy, when that, when that word first came out, it was from them scandalous type individuals, STI. It's a, it was an old gang in the town of a bunch of young motherfuckers who was with the shit. They used to sip both. That's before they started calling it scissor, and that's before they started calling it uh, lean and all of that. We called it robo. You feel me? I'm from the old school town. You feel me? Like, like I, I jumped off the porch in like 96 when I was like 14 before they even built the federal building you know, downtown Oakland. So I really got history, right? But anyway, the young niggas who were sipping boat, and that was like unheard of because we didn't even know about Texas and DJ Screw and all that. I had no connection with that. We didn't play DJ Screw music or Chopping Screw, or there was no real Texas acts. I mean, outside of like Jay Prince and, and you know, Yuck Mouth from the Bay, but, you know, he came out under rap a lot. And, no, you know, you had all of that stuff, but it wasn't like the big boom yet. That shit didn't happen yet. The Slim Thugs and, you know what I'm saying, the Paul Walls and the uh, Shot Millionaire. And, you know, before Texas really had their second run, the first run was like the Ghetto Boys, J. Prince, you know. And then that song, I Want to Be a Baller, Shot Caller, 20 Inch Blaze on the Impala. Like, yeah, that was like... They didn't talk about sipping lean in that. So I thought the boat or, or robo was like some town shit. You know, I didn't even know they did that in um in uh Texas. But anyway, hyphy meant like a nigga who was ready to bust your head. Like when a nigga start spazzing, it wasn't about popping X pills and dancing and Putting wearing loud colors and nothing like that. Hyphy was like a grimy ass nigga who was on the block, not no rapper, not no nigga who talk about this shit, but a nigga that'll bust your head hella quick. Hyphy and Manny like had the same meaning. But some kind of way, somewhere, the word turned into a a different type of thing, you know? And you know, I know where it really came from. But reading about it, I'm like, okay, niggas hitting donuts. Niggas doing the sideshow shit, you know, I could, I could, you know, I know about that, but like, you know, the, the big shades and the weird clothes and doing all of that, no, nah, nah, that's not what hyphy really was, bruh, so I think somewhere along the line, it was a misrepresentation of what that word really meant, and motherfuckers just ran with it. 
I can't find my rolling machine, but it's good. I'm going to do the manual roll. <laughs> I got spoiled with my tree, and I've been rolling with the machine. But anyway, um, so, so you know, the hyphy movement and all that was popping. I know E-40 had the songs with uh, Keep the Sneak and uh, E-40. I was listening to all that in the pen. And I was like, damn, bro, like the, the bay going up. I need to be out there right now so I could go in and catch me a wave. You know what I'm saying? So this is how, you know, me and JT start fucking with each other. Because as soon as I got off the bus coming from motherfucking me, Florida, it was like a two-day bus ride straight from the pen. I got straight home hungry, straight to the studio. I ended up fucking around with 17 Hertz up in Hayward. And one day I'm in there going crazy, bro. I know I was in there gas and shit because somebody knocked on the door right at the studio. We in there. They playing my shit back because they mixing it. And the shit sound like, bro, amazing, bro. If y'all ain't familiar with me and my music, bro, that shit that's on my um, YouTube right now, that's all off my phone. Rap chat with not without an engineer or nobody really mixing my shit down. But, bro, if you hear me in the studio, my shit is crazy, bro. I like get on that Kendrick Lamar slash Eminem, Tupac. Like, I could come, like, a lot of different styles, bro. Like, AZ, nigga, Nas. You know, I fucks with that shit. And, 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 and if you know, you know. You feel me? But anyway, um, I'm going ham one day, and uh, a nigga opened the door. And who is it, bro? It's JT Snake Ass. I didn't talk to him that day, but he, put, poked, he poked his head in there and was looking. And they like, yeah, that's Babyface right there, man. That's Babyface Nelson right there. Because it was Will, the uh, engineer at 17 Hertz. He already knew this nigga. But mind you, everybody be here. E-Fody, Jack, I think, was in the next uh, room over recording. I know because I can hear the music. You know what I'm saying? So I know JT heard about me right then, even though we didn't talk. I remember that day I had on a bucket hat. That shit was black, and it was low to my face where you can't really see my eyes like that. And, uh, you know, I was doing my shit. I really didn't talk much. I just smoked my weed, and I'm a quiet nigga, especially when the more people come around, I'm just watching shit. So um, to make a long story short, like two, three weeks after that first encounter I had with the nigga, even though we didn't talk, he peeked in there and seen who was going crazy, bro, Babyface Nelson. I started fucking with DJ Rick Lee from KMEL, and he had me opening up these shows up in Daly City every motherfucking Thursday, I think. So I had a show every Thursday. So what I did to make my money, because Rick Lee wasn't paying me for these shows, I would open the motherfucking show and he was doing the DJing and it would be a bunch of motherfuckers there performing. But um, so that way I make my money. I had a little play where I make $2,000 a week. Where I go to San Francisco at like 8 in the morning. I have about 50 CDs. And me and my niggas, we'll have a motherfucking boom box. Big ass boom box. And we'll put that motherfucker on, on the escalator area where the bar station come up, nigga, off the underground. And Walgreens right there. We be sitting there slapping my shit. And it'd be like five or six of us. And by the time 11 o'clock come, it's like we having a party out there. It'd be hella motherfuckers over here. They listening to the music. We smoking weed. Motherfuckers handing me money. They handing my partners money. And at the end of the day, all my partners will put all the money in the pot. So it wasn't like me just selling my shit. It, it was me and all my niggas. And it'd be niggas across the street. It'd be niggas on the other side of the street. We right here, two or three of us in front of Walgreens. So... It turned into like every day we making like seven, eight hundred dollars just off the CDs and we got weed out here too. So it was like a whole movement. I ended up fucking with Kev Kelly real tough because we all used to sell weed out there on Market Street. So if y'all know about Kev Kelly, bro, he knows a nigga click clack gang nigga and he fuck with hella niggas, bro. And you know, he go real hard for the city. Nigga real good with them uh, lyrics, bro. You feel me? And me and him kind of gravitated towards each other because we was like just grinding, bro. Underground niggas out here eating. You know what I'm saying? Selling weed, selling music, and trying to get on. So some kind of way between me and Kev Kelly, JT get my motherfucking number. And one day he called me. And he tell me that he want to meet up with me and that I should meet the nigga over there at Burger King on Powell Street. Now, if you're not familiar with this area, Powell Street is set up like, it's like right in between 
the fucking worst ghetto you could ever see in the world, the TLs. And then that's on the left side of Powell Street. <laughs> and then on the right side is like the richest financial district you could ever experience damn near in the world going all the way up towards Embarcadero. So if you in the middle, you're going to be right there on Powell. And then going this way, you're going to be going worse into the ghetto. Going this way, you're going to be getting richer and richer. You know what I'm saying? So he, we meeting like right in the middle in the Burger King. Now, the way that Burger King is set up is where you could walk in on Powell Street. And if you're not familiar, like you got a Blondie's right there. That's real big in the Bay. It's the best pizza in the Bay. You got motherfucking Rasputin underground record store where they sell all the underground shit and all the mainstream shit from the Bay and worldwide. But you're going to find every motherfucking underground bass shit right there. And then you got the jewelry store where you can buy all the motherfucking blue diamonds, yellow diamonds, all the fly shit. It was like a jewelry hub right there with like a hundred different jewelers all in one uh, spot. And they got booths with all authentic shit. You can't buy no fake shit up in here. Everything in here, VVs, bro. You feel me? So this is where we meet at. Now this is where I got my first weird red flag with the nigga JT because you know I'm from uh North Oakland I done been to the pen I'm a Muslim you know I try to take pride and not let nothing get to me to where I'm start to become fearful I only fear a law and when I start to feel like the enemy is around me I seek refuge in the law and that beast start to come out you know you it's a it's a it's a it's a thing they got called fight or flight either you gonna fight or you gonna run the fuck away so when I start feeling a certain way, I get in fight or flight mode. You know what I'm saying? So my first red flag with this nigga by me being a prison nigga, I pay attention to shit. Uh, the nigga tell me, look, man, meet me over here on the side of Burger King. And he like, I'm in this white van. So when I get over there, I'm coming from the TLs. When I get over there, I see the white van. And it's like one of them transportation vans that you see, like, the churches picking up kids in, uh, for Sunday school. Or, like, you know, the uh, medical transport. It'd be like a white van with a bunch of seats and seat belts and shit. You can sit on either side, nigga. He was in one of them, which was like, okay, nigga, on some, some other shit. But he was, like, in the driver's seat. So I come to the passenger seat because I'm trying to jump in because he told me to meet him there. I'm thinking he anticipated me popping up. So I tried to initially open up the door, but it was locked. So it like clink and slid back on me because the motherfucker was locked. So he, I hit the window and the nigga like got frightened. I could tell because he turned and was like, nigga damn near he put his whole back on the on the pass on the driver's side window. And he had the fear look in his face like a nigga caught him slipping, like a nigga was gonna start busting at him. And that was it wasn't even that type of party. I just didn't understand why the nigga was so like agitated like that or so fearful or he appeared to be fearful and as a prison nigga sometimes you, you get into this mode where like this nigga scared that that pterodactyl nigga start trying to come out but it had to suppress that shit you feel me but anyway let me get into it i jump in the car so so as soon as i jump in the car he pull off and i think he started like trying to sell me this dream and immediately you know what I'm saying? I notice when niggas trying to make themselves look like a certain way. You know what I'm saying? So we we sliding through the city. I think we ended up somewhere on mission. We had to go get some gas. And it, it'd be a lot of homeless people out there. So when I went to go get the gas, you know what I'm saying, to pay for it, as I'm coming back, he was out the van and he was like giving, giving some money away. And I noticed he didn't have his shoes on now. You know, he didn't have his shoes on, and, like, it was a it was a bum out there. This, this white dude, bro, like, had matted beard. He had long matted hair. He looked like he was really, like, a derelict type dude. And he got on these motherfucking Air Forces, brand nuki. So I'm like, fig, gave this nigga his shoes. And he didn't say nothing. He didn't, like, nigga, look, I just gave this nigga my shoes. He didn't do none of that. He, we just jumped in the car and, like. You know, that, that impacted me, and it made me put my guard down, but that shit cost me later, but it made me put my guard down, because I said, bro, it don't get no more solid than that, bro, you know what I'm saying, and like, I'm into that type of shit, bro, so, you know, that's where I, how I put my guard down, and he was able to, to play me, my nigga, but, but, but let me get into it, because I don't want to be too long with this. So anyway, my main thing is I didn't know where we was going with this because I didn't know if he was going to like try to take me to the studio 
or if we was just going to fucking, I didn't know what was going to happen, bro. You know, but he started talking about the magazine shit. He like, yeah, I got this magazine company called Mandatory Business. And he was like, man, we could probably make some money real quick just selling people some ass space to get into this magazine. So he like, we're going to do a new issue. I got the journalists, you know, I got uh, the I got the camera right here. So, you know, what we're going to do is I'm going to put my number on Twitter. And when people call, you pick up. So he was like, he explained to me why I was going to pick up. He said, because these people that's calling, they want to talk to me. But if I pick up the phone, it's going to make me seem like I'm desperate. So it's better that you pick up and you like act like you running the, the magazine company. It's like you're going to be the you're going to be the motherfucking uh, CEO. You're going to be the A&R. You know what I'm saying? All of that shit. And I'm just going to be behind the scenes. So I'm like, all right. So uh, to make a long story short, the phone kind of ringing, but it ain't really doing numbers like that. But I think the first day we probably pulled in like 1500 where just different people was calling in. And they might have spent 300 here, 400 here. This motherfucker might have spent the five. You know what I'm saying? It ain't just me. It's like three other people taking these calls, too. We got like four phones ringing. So this is when this shit get tricky. <coughs> One day. Now, mind you, I got to tell you this. Mind you, he was staying on MacArthur off of Hagenberger. And if you, if you coming off, you understand me, the 580... And you coming down, you understand me, Hagenberger. When you get to MacArthur, you're going to see East Mount Mall on this side. You're going to see a church's chicken right here. And then if you bust that left, you feel me, like you're going to see these condos right there. And it was two motherfucking condos right next to each other. You understand me? And this is where headquarters was. I think him and his wife was in the right side. And on the left side, the nigga had all of us. It was me. And a couple other rapid niggas, G bundles. And uh, upstairs, he had this Nation of Islam brother who was like a chef. And the nigga just be sitting there cooking all day, whatever the fuck we want. So, and now this motherfucker is plush. Like, when you walking up the stairs, the nigga got like the motherfucking movie popcorn shit. Nigga, he got the motherfucking lights. You could tell these lights is hella expensive, bro. These ain't regular bulb lights, nigga. He got the fucking sunk in lights in the ceiling. And uh, this motherfucker got three stories. Now, he told me, bro, this is going to be your room right here. So, when he take me upstairs, bro, it's a big-ass room with, like, a big red Nation of Islam flag over the window with one bed in the middle. Nigga, he was like, bro, this your shit right here, bro. You know what I'm saying? You chill out, get you some rest, do whatever you want to do, nigga, and we just going to be trapping all night, bro. You know what I'm saying? In the basement, nigga, we we had the studio hooked up, like a mobile studio. So, um, to make a long story short, like, a few days go by, and one day he he give me like, hey bro, let's go hit um, let's go hit Walmart. He like, cause I'm about to meet Fab up there. So I'm like, you know, me being fresh home, bro. I know this nigga Fab, bro. Me and this nigga went to tech with each other. You know what I'm saying? Like when he first got his motherfucking deal with Gary Archer, nigga, he used to be in that motherfucking burnt orange expedition. This when we was still in high school, so I think. Like, this nigga been on, you feel me? So I'm like, yeah, bro, nigga, call this nigga, bro. This nigga know all about me, bro. That's my partner, bro, you feel me? So, um, but this shit didn't have nothing to do with me. He was already about to meet the nigga. But when we pulled up, we in a Durango truck, a black Durango truck on, like, foes. And I'm in the back of the motherfucker. So, yeah, because he, he got multiple whips. I think nigga had a 500 Benz S, uh, S500 with the bulletproof shit. And then the nigga had a all-black Durango. So we in a Durango, nigga. Mind you, he had the little under shit too. The, the vans and the little under Toyotas and shit. So we in a Durango this time. And uh, the nigga Fab jump in the, the passenger seat. I'm in the back, like on the third row. I don't think the nigga ever noticed I was even in the car. So I'm like smoking a J, just like I'm doing now. And I'm like, nigga, what's up, bruh? And nigga turn around like, oh, shit. Oh shit, you got the nigga with you. He like, okay. He like, y'all two niggas about to do some shit. It's about to go down. This shit gonna be probably epic, right? I got my own relationship with this nigga, Fab, right? So I'm like, okay. So so JT tell the nigga Fab, look, bro, we're gonna we're gonna have you put the post on your Twitter, and we're gonna see how many people we could get to call this phone so we could fill up this next issue of mandatory business. So Fab be like, okay, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Now in my mind. 
I'm thinking this nigga Fabby more enthused to do this shit. He probably already fucked with this nigga Fig. But I know for sure, by me being in this motherfucker, he gonna probably put a little something extra on it for, for me. Nigga, the North Oakland partner, you feel me? Nigga, we ain't like close like this, but we close enough, nigga. You know what I'm saying? I fucks with bro, you fucks with me, nigga. And we got music together and everything. So, to make a long story short, Fabby like, okay, bro, let's do it. Let's do it. You know what I'm saying? Let's do it. So, um, I think that night, nigga, Fabby put the first Twitter blast on there. And I ain't gonna lie, bro, for like two weeks straight, the motherfucking phones did not stop ringing. Probably the only time they stopped ringing was like probably two in the morning to like five in the morning. Like three hours. But from like six to like 1.45 in the morning. Six in the morning to 1.45, that motherfucker ringing all day. And we selling like ads, ads like... Centerfold for a thousand, uh, motherfucking uh, front page like twenty five hundred. If you want to get a full page spread, that was like five six hundred. If you wanted a quarter page, you know what I'm saying you had to spend like two fifty. You know what I'm saying it was something like that to where we was hitting. I mean, at the time it wasn't no cash app or nothing, so we was running to the uh, Western Union like all fucking day. Picking up hella money. We might go twice a day and pick up hella money from Western Union. So after like two weeks of this shit and fucking with Fabby, you know what I'm saying? We probably pulled in like at least 40000 Easy. You know what I'm saying? So my cut was supposed to be like every $500, you know, spread I sell. I think I got 100 from that. So he'll get the four, I'll get the 100 And then if I put in like, let's say, um a front page, then, you know, that might have been 2500 I might have made, like, four, 500 off of that. So, you know, and everybody was calling in, you know what I'm saying? So, to make a long story short, bro, so much money was generated that when it was time for me to get my cut, you know, I asked the nigga, like, bro, you know, we didn't have, we wasn't writing the shit down. I'm pretty sure I was owed more than what we agreed upon. But what we agreed upon was like, I think, 1500 That was going to be easy. You know, just shoot me my 1500 I've been with you for like two weeks. I look at it like this. At least I was basically making my 100 a day that I would have made selling my shit. You know, I probably would have made more than 100 a day, but I at least rounded it off at that. And, um, you know, but look, when it came time for me to get my money, he kept putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. Mind you, the phone's still ringing. We still selling ass space. But now for the next issue, and motherfuckers is buying verses and shit too. It wasn't nothing for some, for like somebody to call to get a page for like five hundred and then spend like two thousand dollars on a verse. So I'm seeing how much money coming in, and you know our last time going to the check cashing to get a Western Union, um, we went to the one on Telegraph and five nine. I think it's a California check cashing right on the side of Walgreens. So. We pull up to get this last uh, money order. I mean, this Western Union. And this one was for a hell of money because it was this dude from Texas. I can't remember his name, bro. I think it was Big A. Nigga, Big A. It's a white dude. Nigga got money, bro. And I think he spent like 1500 just him by himself. You know, and it was for something simple like a page. He paid more than what we was even charging. So, when we went to pick that up and, like, four other Western Unions, you know, now I'm ready for my cut because I've been with this nigga for a while. I've been really neglecting my own shit, you know, because I never even thought about doing no magazine shit. So, to make a long story short, when he got the money out of Western Union, we walked out. We jumped into Durango. We, we hit Telegraph, and I'm telling him to tear mine off. And he, for some reason, it seemed like he didn't want to go in his pocket or he didn't want to pull the money out, and he kept putting me off. But he'd been putting me off for, like, a week. So I'm like, bro, pull the car. Mind you, I done been to prison. I really don't like when people say one thing and then do something different. It make me go in like a different mode, bro, because I done been in the thick of the shit. I done been in race riots. I done been in all kind of wars in the dorm. I done fucking broke niggas the fuck off, bro. You feel me? About the little smallest shit. So this shit right here, you know, I'm like, nigga, pull the car over real quick, bro. And then I jumped out. And then he jumped out because I think I told him, nigga, Either you're going to give me the bread or, nigga, we just going to have to run this fade real quick. Because I feel like you can keep the money. As long as you shoot me the fade, nigga, we good. So when I hop out, 
I didn't know if he was gonna have any money or square up, and it seemed like he was trying to square up, right? So nigga, I see he tripping, nigga. So I square up, nigga, and pull my shirt off. And I'm like, what's happening? And the nigga just look. He look at me. He jump in the car and burn rubber and get up out of there and left me on telegraph. So mind you, I got shit in the car, shit over there in the in the east at the nigga spot. And for the way, like, we've been fucking with each other. We never had no argument or nothing. So for the nigga not to give me the money and then just drive off on me like that, I feel play, bro. And I'm like, nigga, feel like, damn, bro, this nigga got me fucked up, nigga. Because I don't walk around my hood at nighttime like this on Telegraph and shit. And I feel like this nigga left me, like, nigga, on some sucker shit, bro. You, get a, nigga, you feel me? So I walk to the house, and I'm pissed off. I don't even call the nigga that night. But the next day, I called a nigga, bruh, and I'm like, bruh, man, our, our business really ain't handled, bruh, like, because you just drove off, and we didn't get to finish our business, bruh. So he, now, his whole attitude changed. Now it's like, basically, fuck me. I can tell by his voice, and he think this shit a game, bruh. So I tell the nigga, hey, all right, look, bruh, you know you owe me this amount of money. Come over here to my house. I gave him the address, bruh, 36th Street, nigga, where I stay on, on Webster, you feel me? You know, 430, 36th Street. Nigga, I told the nigga, hey, man, slide over here, bro. You feel me? And, uh, you know, I had my, my, my cousin shotgun with me, nigga. Everybody know Pee Wee, nigga, had shotgun with me, nigga. Nigga, the, the big boy from the town. You feel me? So I told my cousin what happened. I'm like, hey, bro, look, when he come over here, you know what I'm saying? Really, I'll take the money. But if he don't want to give me the money, nigga, I'm going to shoot a fade with him. And you just here just to make sure. It don't go like the nigga try to either jump me with some niggas or he try to do some sucker shit. But let me and him have a clean fade, even if nigga I get mopped, nigga. Which you know I already know I ain't finna get mopped, nigga. But I'm like I don't care how it's looking, as long as it's just me and him. Let it let me let me get this in with him. So so feel like all right, I'm about to be over there. So nigga, we got straps, nigga. I got my strap. It's it's, it's right here on the porch. My cousin got his unit on him. But it, it ain't that type of party, but we just always on point. So when the nigga, I'm calling the nigga, he, he like, okay, I'm right around the corner. I'm like, all right, bro, pull up. He know where I stay at anyway. Because the nigga be bringing, he brought me over here hella times and shit. So anyway, and everybody know where the fuck I stay at, bro. So anyway, um, when the nigga pull up, nigga, he on a bike. Nigga on a little ass BMX, right? Got a black hoodie on, he driving, he on the bike hella slow. So I'm like, nigga, this nigga on some weird shit. But I'm like, I'm about to, man, this nigga better have my money. I'm going to break this nigga the fuck off, bro. It ain't about no no gunplay. It ain't about no no sucker shit, bro. This man to man, bro. You don't say one thing and do another, bro. And when the nigga, he didn't get close to us, the nigga was about maybe at least 50 feet away from us when he jumped off the bike. And as he jumped off, he he, he go on his waist and pull out a burner and say, let's have a shootout. And I'm like, nigga, this is in the broad daylight, nigga. Man, I'm like, bro, we could have knocked him down. But, nigga, I'm fresh out the pen. We all got straps. And I'm like, nigga, put the gun down, tough guy, so we could run this fade, bro, because we all got straps, bro. That ain't even, it ain't even that kind of party, nigga. We about to, nigga, throw hands. But the nigga never let go of the gun, and he like, he looked like he's scared now. He get back on the bike, and, like, he dropped the bike, and he didn't know what to do. He wanted to turn around or what. And we like, nigga, for real? And this right in front of, like, it's broad. It's, like, probably 10 in the morning. You know, and, I, and at this time, gentrification just started happening in the town. This is, like, 2008, nigga. Gentr gentrification just started happening. So, to make a long story short, it was a bunch of white people just, you know, all around my house, bro. Like, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, the nigga knew what he was doing because he knew it wasn't going to be no shootout right there. And I, literally, this right across from the police station, the highway patrol is right here. So I'm like, this nigga was scared to throw hands. Now, that's twice the nigga, nigga didn't give me my fade, bruh, and didn't give me my money, bruh. You know, so I was like, man, fuck that nigga, bruh. The nigga, the nigga kept the money, nigga. He didn't want to give me my fade. He just basically kept my money, bruh. Then pulled the strap on me, nigga. You know, I done been hit up, nigga. I done been hit. Nigga, I done been stabbed, nigga, in the, in the pen, nigga. You know what I'm saying? I done been through all kind of fuck shit, bruh. You know what I'm saying? I done, nigga, I done been through it, bruh, to where I'm like, nigga, I could have gave him the blues as soon as he pulled up. If, that, if it was going to be like that, we could have ambushed the nigga as soon as he hit the corner on Webster Street. But we didn't want to do a nigga like that, bruh. You know what I'm saying? 
But he got that one off, you know what I'm saying? He kept the money, didn't shoot me my fag. But guess what happened after that? The nigga never showed his face in California again, nigga. Because he knew, nigga. He fucked up, nigga. He fucked up and he disappeared and went to Atlanta. Nigga still ain't been back. You know what I'm saying? So, to make a long story short, nigga, you feel me? That's how I started my magazine company, Base Star Magazine. I did the same thing that he showed me how to do. Got about $20,000 for my first issue, selling ass space, nigga. Me and my nigga show, nigga. You know what I'm feeling? From West Mac, nigga. We pressed up uh, 3,000 copies. Nigga, we had that shit in all over. Nigga, Omeba, Rasputin. That shit was in Dolores. You know, downtown Oakland, the biggest magazine store. Nigga, that shit was all over. Nigga, in L.A., we made plenty of money. And Bay Star Magazine got cranking, bro. It got yanking, you feel me? And, um, you know what I'm saying? But, um. Yeah, man, Fig was gone after that, bruh. And uh, to make a long story short, I still ain't seen the nigga since then. But now, rewind and fast forward, nigga, I ended up going to the pen again. You feel me? California this time. You feel me? I did 16 with half, and then I had a couple little county runs. You know what I'm saying? And then I ended up taking a break on all, all of this shit just to go to school and figure out about real estate and what to do with my money, bro. You feel me? As far as buying property and doing all the right investments, you know what I'm saying? And that's where I'm at today, bro. Based on magazine, bro. You feel me? I'm a homeowner. You feel me? I own my bins. I own my Chevy. You know what I'm saying? And I learned a lot of shit from that nigga. But one thing I never do as a man is say I'm going to do something and don't do it. And the second thing is I never give a nigga or I never turn a nigga down if he want the fair one. If a nigga want to shoot the fade as a man and you want to do a man-to-man fade, I got to give you that. You feel me? Otherwise, bro, what the fuck am I and what I'm doing, bro? You feel me? So I got most stories. You feel me? I'm going to end this one right here. I don't want to be too, too verbose. You feel me? And uh, right now we at 36 minutes. You feel me? So that's a long time, bro. I hope y'all enjoyed the story, man. If y'all got any feedback, you know what I'm saying? Put that in the comments below. Let me know how you feel about my story. You feel me? Um, give me your perspective because I see things one way. You might see it another way. Or you feel me? Like I say, bro, I'm not here to talk about nobody, but I'm here just to speak facts, bro. You feel me? My next uh, story I'm going to do where I'm going to talk about live wire. And how I was fucking with them niggas, recorded hella music, you feel me? Shooting videos, fucking with hella niggas, you feel me? And I'ma talk about Livewire, how I, uh, you know, started fucking with them niggas. And Ronald Mack, Shady Nate, Stevie Joe, and that whole story, bro. So stay tuned, bro. This F-A-C-E. Thank you for joining, man. Feet on the ground, ears to the street. Coming at you with another groundbreaking exclusive.